Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the last lecture for the module C0452 Programming Concepts. And in this last lecture, we're going to introduce the final application for the module. And we're also going to introduce the concept of inheritance and introduce you to a design pattern. So let's start by having a look at this final application. And it's called the world of Zool. And it's based upon the classic game, Colossal Cave Adventure. Okay, and we're gonna give you a template of this game. It's a text-based game, uh, shows you a menu, and uh, you input commands to it and get it to move around different locations in a map. We'll explain more about that in just a moment. But anyway, we're gonna give you a template, uh, a place to start, and then you have to extend that further and it's your chance to get creative with coming up with a scenario for your game and also implement uh, your ideas so that players can enjoy playing the game. So you may like to take the opportunity to work in teams as well. You can do this solo or you can choose to do it in uh, a pair or a group of three and uh, have fun with it. Okay, so let's uh, have a look then at this game. And as I said, it's based upon Colossal Cave Adventure, which is a real life game. It was uh, developed during the early 1970s and has been extended since. Okay, and it's a text-based game. And originally it relied on uh, players to navigate through this cave system. They had to find treasure and uh, use secret command words to uh, score as many points as possible. Okay, so that was the original game. And World of Zor is based Based on it, it's influenced uh, by that original game, but instead is set at a university. So you could stick with the university scenario or you could uh, change the scenario completely, of course. That is completely up to you. That's your uh, creativity and your freedom to do that. Okay, um, so it's your chance to have fun and implement some of the ideas that we have been teaching throughout this module. Okay, so some basics of the game there that you need to be accustomed with are the different commands that you type in uh, on the interface in order to navigate around this uh, map of locations. Okay, and uh, one of the commands here that's quite important is the go command. All right, we've got some code here set up for you which will interpret this. And uh, this is the same as the original uh, game where you would type in the keyword go followed by the direction. So here at the bottom of this slide we see a sample output telling us where we are. We're outside the main entrance of the university and we've got these exits. Okay and then the little arrow there, little chevron, uh, is where we would input something into the console. And if we type keyword go followed by a direction, space in between, treated as two separate words, they're interpreted as that, but the go command followed by the direction in which you want to travel. So obviously we have to type in a direction which is available. We couldn't type in north in this case. We can't go anywhere there. We're given these three directions, south, east, and west. So we'd have to choose one of those. And in this case, we are choosing to go south. All right. And that moves you on to the next uh, location in the map. All right. So it's a text-based game. It's not a GUI. Uh, Perhaps if you're looking for an extension, you might want to go on and uh, create a GUI for this perhaps. Um, but here, just a text-based version would be perfectly fine. Okay, just to get used to responding to input, which we've covered previously. Okay, so if you need a refresher on input, go back and, and watch some of the previous lectures that talk about that. And then how to interpret uh, those string inputs or numerical inputs, okay. Let's have a look at some of the other commands for the game. So go is one of them, we've just seen that. And there are also others as well, such as help. Okay, that will just display a list of instructions, some uh, handy tips to get started, how to use the game. You might want to also modify that to display your goal, maybe what you're trying to achieve, or more context to the scenario, more hints perhaps as to uh, what to do and what to look for during your game. This is completely up to you, of course. You're the ones that are gonna be writing the game. 
And uh, we've also got other commands such as take, so that's implying items, okay? The implication is that you are uh, going to create some items to be collected throughout your game in different uh, locations or perhaps en route to location, up to you, um, which might help you to score more points, might help you to unlock certain rooms, maybe they're locked and you need to find the key to unlock them, uh, or certain other items that help you to fulfill the goal. Okay, so here we've got an example of that. Uh, we're listing a number of items that are available in a particular location on the map. Eraser, board pens, key, uh, if we're in the lecture theatre, we've got the exits as well. So we could either type in go to go to one of the exits or type in take followed by one of the items, okay? Casing might be important there, so just be aware if you uh, use uppercase or lowercase there, you might have to uh, think about that, all right? Um, but uh, that's one of the other commands which is given to you, take, but I think you have to go ahead and add the items yourselves. All right, so hopefully this is uh, starting to give you a bit of an idea of how the game works. It's a text-based game. You're supposed to navigate through the different rooms, uh, which are uh, built as a location class. We're going to see that in just a moment. And those are stored in the map. Okay. And then, of course, we have various classes to interpret the input and process the keywords that we type in. And in fact, that brings us nicely on to looking at the different classes. So let's explore those as we've been mentioning about it. Here we go. This is the view of BlueJay. We've got a simple class diagram here. I mentioned map and location before. They are there. Let's just see some annotations here. Yeah, so the map stores the location objects, objects of the location class. Those represent the rooms. So. In the template given to you, they represent different areas around a university. You could stick with that scenario. You could change it completely. Okay, you might want to come up with a different uh, location and a different set of rooms. That's completely your creative license to do that. You can uh, think that through. Okay, but each one of those objects are stored in the map. And perhaps you might want to think about whether there's a, a different way of storing them as well. I don't want to give too much away. That's up to you to design this game. Um, but uh, either way, those are going to be collected and stored in the map in some form or another. I think they're built as just individual objects, but you might want to think about how you can collect those objects, uh, perhaps. And uh, in the game class uh, is, is basically the entry point for the program. It starts the game, creates the objects of the map and the command reader. Okay, so that's what you have to create an object of to start with uh, in order to load the game and run the game. Okay, so those are the bottom three classes. And then up above, we've got a command reader which has the object of scanner. Remember we talked about input before and uh, the various different methods for interpreting input, uh, the next methods which return next line, you've got next int, next char, next boolean, etc., etc. So we've got the object of scanner in command reader. And then uh, we've got a command words enumerate type. So remember the enumerate type, we covered that earlier in the module. That's a custom type for a limited number of commands. You may choose to expand that if you want to, but uh, we've got a few in there already. Those are things like go, help, take, quit. All right, if you need to do something else, you might want to add that to your enumerate type as well, but that should be enough to get you started, certainly with a basic uh, version of the game. And uh, then we've got this Zool command abstract class and also some children classes, child classes, which inherit from this Zool command. And those three classes there, Zool command, go command, take command, and help command, are the embodiment of a design pattern, which is called the command pattern. We're going to introduce that a little bit later on in this lecture. Okay, so I'll save the explanation of that uh, until we get there. Okay, let's talk now about inheritance. Let's start with inheritance and that'll lead us nicely on to the design pattern. Okay, so you're probably familiar with the uh, definition of inheritance, uh, which is when uh, generation inherits from the next generation, uh, assets are passed down, okay, from parents to children, typically, from humans and also animals as well. Um, 
And in programming, this concept, it's an object-oriented concept, is expressed in terms of having a child class which uh, has access to the variables and the methods of another class, which is therefore designated as the parent. Okay, so just quickly go back to this. The go command, take command, and help command are inheriting from Zool command. Okay, they are the child classes, the children, as the arrow points towards the parent. Okay, and there are actually lots of different terms you may come across for describing inheritance in coding terms mentioned child and parent before with the child pointing to the parent okay uh, but we also have other terms as well such as the derived class which is the equivalent of child class which inherits from the base class if you have a base class then you have something which derives from it, it extends it further okay so that's another equivalent term there and then finally you've also got superclass which acts as the parent or the base class and also the subclass uh, the derived class or the child class. Okay, so those are equivalent terms, all right? Personally, I like to use parent and child as that's most relatable as humans, but uh, if you would prefer to use base and derived or super and sub, of course you can do. And depending upon which book you read, uh, you will see different terms anyway. But uh, I'm gonna try and stick with parent and child just so we get used to that. But of course the arrows point the same way. So look out for those arrows there uh, with bigger arrowhead and usually a transparent or white uh, color there. Okay. And in order to implement inheritance in Java, uh, we have to use the keyword extends. So in the child classes, remember we had go command, take command, and uh, help command. Uh, in those class definitions, as you can see here, we've got one example for the go command. We have to write the keyword extends after the class name, the child class name, and then followed by the parent class name to indicate that we are going to inherit from that parent class, which is Zool command. So Zool command is the parent class, and then those three children classes given to you embodying the command design pattern are going to act as the child classes, which inherit uh, aspects of the Zool command parent class. Okay, so that's Java. It will be different in other languages. In C sharp, it's colon, um, and I think it's also C, I think it's also colon in uh, C as well. So it will vary from from language to language, um, but in, in Java, it's extends. Okay, let's move on now and talk about super. And uh, a good reference point for this would be the keyword this, which hopefully we've used and seen a little bit now. We've seen it in some of the previous applications. Remember this, uh, we use within the class constructors to refer to the variables um, of any given object that's going to be created. So it's a way of uh, giving a placeholder, which can later then be substituted with a specific instance, an instantiation of a class. We don't want to code specific object names because every time we call the method or the constructor, it will only ever operate on that defined specific object. So therefore we want to leave it open so that it can be replaced, that placeholder, with any given object uh, of that class structure. Okay, so there's an equivalent of that for the parent reference. Within the child, we can call the super reference, which gives us access to the parent. Again, we don't want to name the parent uh, hard-coded, because otherwise we only ever uh, will get access to that. And I appreciate in this case, well, in, in Java, we're only able to inherit from one class anyway. There's only single inheritance. In other languages, you can do multiple inheritance. But uh, we're going to use the super reference. And if you attach parentheses to the end of that, that's a call to the parent's constructor. So you'll see an example of that in the code here, where um, something from the child constructor is then passed to the parent's constructor. And uh, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. And likewise, you can also uh, refer to variables and methods of the parent through the super reference as well, just like you would for this, as we see below. Okay. 
If we move on to this slide here, you'll see an example of that in the go command, take command, and uh, help command, where in those ch children constructors, you'll see that there's a call to the super, the parents uh, constructor. Remember, super class is the equivalent of the parent uh, and base, uh, the different terms, okay, super in Java, which we are going to pass a parameter, which was passed into the child constructor of go command. It's the object of the game class called Zool. We're then going to root that through and pass it to the parents constructor in that uh, first statement there in the go command constructor. And then underneath that, we have got a reference to this, which refers to the object of go command. Okay, so just remember that's a handy way to get access to the parent uh, through the child. And there's, there's an important reason why we do this as well in this particular case. Uh, we're going to come to that. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about encapsulation again. So we introduced this right uh, in the first lecture. So you've seen instances of public uh, methods and you've also seen private data as well. And you may have also seen some private methods. Uh, remember private means that you can only access or call particular members within the class that they're defined in. So if you've got a private method, it can only be called from within that class. It can only be called from another method that's located in that class, okay? And likewise, if you have private variables as well, they can only be referred to and assigned uh, in the particular class that they're defined in. Public means it can be accessed from any class, anything can call it. So that's usually why we have public methods and the constructor would have to be public of a class in order to be able to call it, as is our main uh, method. Uh, we have to declare that to be public so it can be called from outside of the class it's declared in. But then we have a protected scope here. And this is going to play an important part in our inheritance hierarchy because protected is a nice blend between the two. Protected means that it can be accessed within the class hierarchy. So if we were to declare something to be private within our parent uh, class, that means the children wouldn't be able to access it because it's not public to other classes. It's only uh, visible and uh, usable by the members of the parent class. So protected as a halfway house, it allows, it's public to the children, it can be inherited, but it's private to classes outside of the hierarchy. Okay, so that's why when you have a look at the Zool command class, which is the parent class in this case, you'll notice two protected variables at the top there. They're not public and they're not private. Okay, they're protected. That means that uh, the children classes, uh, go command, take command and help command, can uh, inherit these, refer to them. Okay, and it means that other classes outside of the hierarchy, the inheritance hierarchy, uh, cannot access these. They can't set values for them, okay? So that's protected. And I think we're now about to come on to abstract classes, yes, which you would have seen in the uh, class diagram and you no will have seen it here too in the declaration of the class. So let's talk about abstract classes because Zool command is declared to be an abstract class. And again, like the natural definition of the word abstract, that means something is intangible. Okay, we can't uh, touch it, feel it, sense it, uh, look at it, etc. So therefore, how that translates into code, it means that an abstract class cannot be instantiated. Again, because it's intangible, there's no representation of this idea. So Zool command itself, we can't create an object of it. That's why we have children classes, because in, in an abstract class, you would implement the children. That's why you have those uh, child classes there which inherit from Zool command. We don't have a particular representation of just a generic Zool command. Instead, we have representations of the specific commands like go or take or quit or help, okay? And if you imagine there's another example here which I find quite helpful, uh, which is the 
generic type animal, okay, we don't just create a representation of a generic animal. It has, animals are specific instances, aren't they? They're either a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a fox. Okay, we don't just have a, a generic animal which isn't uh, any one of those uh, specific types like dog, cat, rabbit, or fox. Okay, um, but we can create a, an abstract animal class so that we can group the combined characteristics and the behavior that these specific instances of animals share in common, which they, they would. It will have four legs, uh, a pair of eyes, etc. Um, so we can declare variables and methods within our abstract classes, which we then inherit in the children classes, and we create objects of the children rather than the parents. Okay, so you're going to see that here, as as shown previously. Okay, so Zor command is abstract, so we have to create instances of go command, take command, and help command, okay? And there's actually an abstract method within Zor command. That's another aspect of uh, abstract classes. We can have abstract methods, which again, don't have a representation. They don't have an implementation. So instead, the children classes will provide the implementation for that, okay? And in fact, I think that's what we're coming to. Yes, design patterns. So, Generally, design patterns in the most general sense just refers to a number of architectural solutions um, which all the current, current solutions out there will be one of them, okay? So in the engineering discipline, all the different architectural solutions you see out there like bridges, roofs, buildings, etc., are gonna be based upon a limited number of patterns even though they may look different or have a slightly different design, uh, they will draw upon some of these foundational patterns. There's only so many different types of unique uh, bridges out there. I think the six uh, is gonna be one of those six different types, okay? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can use um, patterns that exist and just customize them or use a combination of the two patterns, okay? so. Design patterns was then applied to programming and object-oriented software design. Uh, indeed, uh, there's a famous book uh, which was written in the mid-90s um, by these authors here, which are known correctly as the Gang of Four. Um, so if ever you see a reference to the Gang of Four and design patterns, it's most certainly these guys who wrote the uh, design patterns uh, book in the uh, mid-90s, where they applied some of these uh, and they, and they, and they catalogued these different design patterns. They looked and found you know, patterns amongst all the different uh, solutions out there uh, uh, for software and found that actually you can have so many uh, unique patterns of which most of the software out there is based on, okay? And they found that there were three different classifications of patterns out there. There were structural, which is to do with the composition of classes and objects. And then you also have behavioral patterns, which concern the interaction and distribution of responsibility um, between classes and objects. And then there were creational patterns, which concern how objects are created, okay? So we're gonna have a look at just one of these patterns, which is the command pattern, and it's a behavioral pattern, okay? Uh, you've already seen it, it's the Zool command. It's the, Zool command. Um, the key to this pattern is that there needs to be an abstract command class, which is our parent, Zool command, which has an abstract execute method, which you'll see in the code. And then you have the concrete instances of uh, the, ch the children classes, um, go, uh, commands, take commands, help command, which then provide the specialist implementations for that abstract method in the command class, the parent class, okay? So having a look here, you'll see that, uh, we could take a look at the code in just a sec. Uh, the execute method is declared abstract in the Zool command class, the parent one. So it has no implementation, there's no method body there. Uh, you'll just see a semicolon at the end. Uh, in some other languages it's assigned to zero, but in Java it's just a semicolon at the end of the signature. 
And then the children classes then provide the, the body, the block of code for that execute method, as you'll notice if you have a look at the code there. So here we go, coming back to our Zool command, you'll see this here. And notice that there's no body in that execute method, just a semicolon. It's then up to the children go command, in this case, to provide a way of implementing that abstract method. And then it's specialist to the go command. Okay, so it's a particular design pattern that's uh, useful out there, it's being used um, to solve problems. Okay, and you'll see that in all of the help commands. There you go, there's a, a specific implementation of execute, uh, which just prints out different uh, help and hints, okay? And, um, and then finally as well in the take command as well. So if you want to create another command, you might want to implement another child class, uh, which then overrides and provides the implementation for the execute method. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our introduction to the world of Zool as well as an introduction to inheritance, abstract classes, and a design pattern. So I hope that was useful, and I wish you good luck with coding your final application for the module, and I hope you have fun whilst doing so.